Earth Science, Chapter 2, Earth and Space. There's some nice apps for smartphones you may want to look into. I've listed some ones I like here. There's a Sky Map or for the Google and, and I these all work on the iPhone. Um, they also work on the Android or they may have their own version like Google Sky Map is for the Android. Light meter is interesting because it shows you uh, how bright something is. Astro panel, NASA, um, Sky Map for Android, and then there's a uh, Space Junk Light that's interesting because Space Junk Light shows you all the stuff that's going around the uh, Earth, orbiting the Earth. For example, if you happen to see the Sandra Bullock movie with um, called Gravity, then you saw space junk um, in that fictional account of getting the space station blo uh, broken up and Sandra Bullock having to figure out how to get back to the Earth. This is a Excel file that I have listed on the um, on the course uh, files that you can look at. If you click this link, it will take you to the uh, a website that does the same thing. But I like the Excel file better because it gives you more control of the rate and speed that you can go from a very small micro level to a, a tremendously large macro level of universe small to universe large. And it does it by powers of 10. And it's just amazing the universe that God has made and how small things are and how large things are and it's, yet it's all under his hand. This is a video I'd like you to watch on how the universe can be measured using um, um, luminosity and um, <clears throat> it's just useful to think about how, how, do, uh, how do astrophysicists understand the size of the universe that's out there. And there's some very good tools that have been developed, including luminosity, on, on uh, measuring the size of the universe. <clears throat> One way to measure objects in space and the distance from the Earth is with parallax. And that's good up to about 330 light years or 100 parsecs. And we'll define parsecs in a little bit. But basically what you're doing is you're, you're triangulating from one side of the sun, say when the Earth's in space in January, versus the other side of the sun when the Earth's in space in July. And you can see the red dot in the January view with the same grouping of stars. The white, white stars are, um, are the same in all four blue pictures. But the red dot of the ob object that's being measured distance-wise moves from one side, from when the Earth is on one side of the sun in January to the other side of the sun in July, and that parallax um, can be measured. It's it's similar to um, like if you close one eye and then close another, things will change uh, change where they are just because your eyes are in a different location from one side of your head to the other. Cluster parallax is um, up good up to about uh, a little over 2,600 light years. And an example of that is the Pleiades cluster is multiple, multiple objects in space, and then they move in relative distance as multiple objects. And because they're multiple objects, they move in relationship to multiple things, other objects, and you can use that to look further out into space. <clears throat> the satellite Hipparchos is useful for uh, measuring up to about 660 light years. And I, I just wanted to, um, to define parsec as an abbreviated form of a distance corresponding to a parallax of one second. In other words, um, again, we're measuring the speed of light, and we do it by the amount of time it takes light to move. It was coined in 1913 at the suggestion of British astronomer 
Herbert Hall Turner. So a parsec is the distance from the sun to an astronomical object which has a parallax angle of one arc second. And you can go back up and look at the uh, little diagrams that we got above to kind of think through the math on that if you're interested. Now cephalid variables are very, very useful in understanding the size of the universe because we can measure out to about 13 million light years with these. And a cephalid variable, a, a way to think of them is a, is a lighthouse. The brightness of a cephalid variable or a type of a star varies. And at one time it's brighter than another. And the period from when it's bright to when it's dim is or when it's bright and then dim and then bright again um, is constant and the magnitude is the same from one mountain to one trough in that uh, that period of time and we can use these to measure distance um, <clears throat> if you look at this nice graph it compares luminosity or how bright something is compared to the sun to a period of time in days. And notice that the Cephalid variables are brighter when the blinking on and off timing is slower. In other words, if it takes a hundred days to go from one bright time and dimming then to the next bright time, that would correspond to a luminosity of 30,000 times brighter than the sun. So these space lighthouses, because they correlate nice and neat uh, between luminosity and period of time of um, getting brighter and dimmer, it's very useful in understanding and measuring I think, the distances in space. Um, so cephalid stars oscillate between two states, and this is this is what causes them to change their luminosity. In one of the states, the star is compact, and large temperatures and pressure gradients build up in the stars. These large pressures cause the tar star to expand, and when the star is in its contracting, expanding state, there's a much weaker pressure gradient in the star. Without that pressure gradient to support the star against gravity, the star contracts and the star returns it to its compressed state. Cephalid variable stars have masses between 20 and 25 times the mass of the sun, so they're much larger than the sun. And these more massive stars are brighter or more luminous and have extended envelopes. In other words, the outer gas layers of the star are much larger than our sun. I'm glad that um, God gave us our sun and not one of these because we would not be able to live close to one of these. Here's a video that you want to watch that just shows you about, about Cephalid variable V1 and how they used it in 1923 to understand more about these objects in space. Another useful tool in measuring distance in space is redshift distances and these are useful out to 300 or 3,000 million parsecs or about 10,000 million light years or um, 10, 10 trillion light years. By studying the motions of other galaxies with standard candles in other words, cephalid variables in other galaxies, we can use redshift to measure distances throughout the universe. Um, <clears throat> the Hubble constant is, a, is useful because it's used in measuring the current expansion rate of the universe to extrapolate back to the Big Bang or when God first created the universe, um, space and time. And we've got a little diagram that shows the history of the universe from when God first created it to where we are today on, and how it expanded from that initial Big Bang. And this extrapolation depends on the current density of the universe and the uh, 
composition of the universe. Uh, here's some hotly debated topics in cosmology. Um, there's the suggestion that atomic behavior ran on in a different time scale from the one we have now, um, which would then result in frequency of radiation emitted in the past being lower than the frequency of the same kind of atoms now, or a lengthening of the wavelength over, over distance. Uh, the problem with that is the amount of redshift would be too small, so it was dismissed. And so what we're looking at here is um, when somebody puts out an idea of say an expanding universe what are some what are some um, ideas that pushed against that in other words it's the nature of science to come up with an idea and the nature of some uh, another scientist to argue against it see if they can disprove it and so this is one one attempt to try and disprove um, what we're uh, is commonly understood about the nature of the expanding universe from beginning at a big bang to the way it is today and then continuing to expand and seeing redshift all over the universe and redshift being um, um, the um, fact that stars um, change their um, um, light toward a slower direction or shifting to a red the red side of the spectrum um, meaning that they're moving away from us. Um, this is a common diagram that NASA has put out that you can find on the web. I really like it because basically it shows uh, the creation to where we are today. And um, it, you, it was, I, I think NASA probably developed it as a way to try and um, get government funding for um, the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe um, but that's just why they, they show the W map there but I think it's really nice to be able to look at this and think through um, just how fast has the universe been growing over time notice the very quick initial expansion of the universe when God first created it 13.7 billion years ago and then it slowed down and then it's continuing um, it is a fairly steady rate of expansion until um, the last uh, third of its history or so, and then it's expanding a little bit quicker. Um, notice the very first part of the um, expansion of the universe. It was dark. And I really like the way that um, ties into what Scripture says. Um, when you see what it says first stars about 400 million years ago um, I like I like the interpretation that when God said let there be light he 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 had initially created the universe and there was darkness because no light existed till finally the uh, material of the universe started condensing enough for where, where stars could be begin to shine in other words hydrogen and helium consolidated enough and and gravity push the molecules and, and atoms together enough that they were able to um, give off light. And so the first stars were about 400 million years after the initial creation of the universe. Here's some possible models of an expanding universe. And we've just been talking about that. The past is in the bottom part of these diagrams. Present is the kind of the middle part with a little box around it and the future is up the top. Um, <clears throat> so we have three types of mod models for expanding universe. A decelerating universe, one that initially expanded and slows down and then may even contract to where um, it stops. And then some people present the idea that it, it implodes and then it's creates and goes back again and expands again. It's interesting how that fits more of a Hindu model of reincarnation, whereas starting at one spot and then expanding and then eventually dying kind of fits um, the Judeo-Christian worldview a little better, I think. 
Anyway, then you have a coasting universe where it kind of expands and just kind of keeps going. And then a universe that accelerates where it um, size of the universe uh, just gets bigger and bigger, but geometrically so. This is a model similar to the one we looked at a couple slides ago and it reveals a change in the rate of expansion since the universe birth and this says 15 billion years but the current thinking is that's um, closer to 14. Uh, the more shallow the curve the faster the rate of expansion so um, the universe seems like it's getting a little bit accelerating in its expansion here just recently. Okay, so here's a couple questions. I should have marked this in blue, but it's okay. List the concept features in order of size beginning with the largest. Well, the largest is the universe, then smaller than that is a galaxy, then a star, and a planet. So uh, we have the universe, and we live in the Milky Way galaxy. Um, Earth orbits the sun, which is a star, and then we live on planet Earth. Earth science, Earth and space, stars and planet. Stars vary in size, they vary in age. This is the Hertzsprung Russell diagram. It's an important diagram in that it is a one diagram description of the um, relationship between how bright or lum luminous a star is with its temperature. And it also shows the different types of stars you see um, out in space. So giant stars are a hundred to a thousand times brighter than the sun, but they burn out faster. And giant stars burn out in 10 to 20 million years. Intermediate sized stars such as the sun will last approximately 10 billion years. Um, the Earth sun system, Earth is about um, between four and five billion years old and so we're just right in the middle of the length of time our sun will will live and you can see where our sun is located it's right in the middle of the main sequence and um, if you look at the reasons to believe website um, there's all kinds of good information I, I think I've included that for some of your reading on just how unique and special our sun is as compared to other types of stars in the universe. Um, here's a diagram that explains the Hertzsprung-Russell here's a video that explains the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. I'd like you to watch this and so if you click the link it'll take you to the website and you can watch it on YouTube. Um, <clears throat> 90% of the human body is made up of hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon. In other words, mostly water and carbon. And um, uh, five other um, elements nitrogen, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur make up another 90%, so we're up to 99%. And then the rest, the other 1% of what makes our, our human bodies are small amounts of um, other elements. Well, hydrogen was formed soon after the Bing, Big Bang, and so when God first created the universe with the Big Bang, hydrogen formed soon after that. And the other elements and, are, and complex compounds were formed during the life cycle of stars. So if you think about what we're made of, we're made of what was made initially in stars. Um, we're, um, God had, God used the um, forces and this systems in the cosmologists study and astrophysicists study in stars to make um, what the components of life are. Um, <clears throat> well gravity pulled together irregular clouds of gas and dust generated from the Big Bang to form galaxies or systems of stars. Uh, this is a, a picture from Hubble telescope looking out deep out into space and those are all galaxies we're looking at. <laughs> thousands and thousands of galaxies which are made up of 
untold number of stars. It's just amazing. Um, gas and material were clumped together to form millions of stars, and it's an ongoing process. Uh, this is a false color image from um, NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope, and it shows cool gas and dust that are incubators for new stars. Well, very high temperatures and pressures in the interiors of stars fuse hydrogen atoms together. We call that nuclear fusion to form helium. Well, hydrogen has um, two protons in the nucleus, or no, hydrogen has one proton in the nucleus. It's the most simple uh, element, and um, helium has two protons in the nucleus. Well, a star will burn out when the hydrogen is used up. So the main fuel that makes a star run is um, and give off light is nuclear fusion. <clears throat> well, the star will collapse when hydrogen is used up, and it, it results in a temporary temperature rise in expansion and forms a red giant star. Higher temperatures will fuel more fusion in converting helium to carbon in these red giants. Well, fusion would end when helium is then used up, and the loss of the heat of fusion will form a small white dwarf star, which will then cool to a, a black dwarf star. So you start to see some of the life cycle of stars, and that Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is helpful in understanding more. Giant stars collapse over multiple stages, initially forming supergiant stars. Um, in the final stage, um, in a mass, is a massive explosion or a supernova that fuses heavier elements together and blasts them throughout the universe. So, heavier elements, uh, where you have lots and lots of protein or protons together in the nucleus of an atom, are formed in these explosions of supernova, and. Again, when you look at the uh, periodic table of elements, it's interesting to think about that the stuff you're seeing in there came from stars. And what a wonderful tool God made when he created stars to make the stuff of what uh, we see around us. When stars are formed, they're surrounded by a rotating disk of cosmic debris, and gravity pulls that debris together to form planets, and planets then revolve in a constant, consistent direction around the star. Heavier, rockier planets are closer to a star, and lighter, gas-rich rich planets are further from the star. And so we see rocky planets that are going around the sun of, um, of Mercury, Venus, and Earth, and Mars. And then further out are the gaseous planets, for example, Jupiter and Saturn are gaseous planets. So here's a question. Which of the following statements is most accurate? Explain the reason for the answer as well as why you did not choose either of the two answers. Well, the best answer is stars are approximately the same age as their orbiting planets. Well, A cannot be correct. In other words, all stars and planets are about the same age because some stars have already been through a complete life cycle. Supernova. In other words, the word all isn't going to work there. Um, C can't be correct um, because stars are being born in the universe just like others are dying. We have no way of knowing how many stars exist and there's no way of knowing whether birth or death or stars, whether birth or death or stars dominates. The planet, the process of planet formation is evidence that stars and their planets are about the same age. Okay, here's a concept map. Um, again, we're talking about systems when we're looking at Earth science, and these concepts maps are helpful to put concepts together. So if we just kind of start with one, if you'll find one there, kind of over by supernova. A supernova converts simple elements such as hydrogen and helium, and then down to 11, to more complex forms such as carbon and oxygen and carbon, which are, they go up to number two, present in planets. And then an example of a planet, number three, going down again is Earth, which orbits the sun. Okay, we're kind of done there. Let's kind of go back up to the top. 
um, the Big Bang, um, uh, in, the, in the Big Bang, um, gas and dust formed cosmic debris and clouds, which formed early versions of galaxies. And then over in the universe, the universe, the field of nine, go up to the Big Bang, began to expand rapidly following the Big Bang. And the universe also contains billions of galaxies. And then galaxies contain billions of stars. And stars, number 10, destroyed in an explosion known as a supernova. Anyway, so that's, here you see the, the way these different, um, different um, entities relate to each other using a concept. Earth Science, Chapter 2, Earth and Space, the Solar System. Okay, let's start with new ideas and old ideas. So new ideas and old ideas. Um, some questions people have thought about and we didn't you think about why why is Earth the only planet known to support life? Um, however, our views in Earth's position in space changed over time. Um, why is it warmer in summer and colder in winter? How does Earth's relative position relative to the sun control the climate? Well, these are questions that are important to ask and the answers aren't necessarily easy to understand. Um, it's interesting to come to some of these questions from our, our modern uh, worldview of things because um, that's not, you know, <laughs> That's just our modern worldview of things. It's not the way everybody's thought throughout time. And we're going to get into some of the history of some of these ideas in this lecture. Um, we have a picture there of Earthrise taken by sci uh, astronauts aboard Apollo 8 in December 1968. Um, Apollo 8 orbited the moon, um, getting ready for um, uh, humans to land on the moon later in 1969 and it's interesting to think about here humans are orbiting the moon and then looking at the earth rising instead of the sun rising or the moon rising um, <clears throat> ancient civilizations um, many of them interpreted um, the earth as being the center of the universe. The sun rose in the east and set in the west, indicating the sun moved and revolved around the earth. Um, that remained the dominant idea for more than 2,000 years. And here we have a picture of an early diagram with the earth as the center, or geocentric. Geo meaning earth, centric, center. So the planets and the sun um, orbit around the earth. Um, you know, the sun rises and the sun sets. And we say that now as if the sun were moving. We, we say it all the time in our language. And we just assume that the earth is revolving around the sun when we say that. But it's interesting we don't change our language to match what we really know as being true in science. I think that's important to think about as we think about the way um, words are used especially um, when you think about interpreting your Bibles. Well, think about the way words are used many years ago before modern science uh, because people were observing the heavens around them and saying the sun rises and the sun sets as if the sun moves. And we still say that. And that's okay. But um, um, we want to be careful and not drawing too much out of that statement and saying, okay, well, then the Bible does say that the sun moves. <laughs> you know, we laugh at that, but, but um, that really is literally what it says. And so, so how do we move from a geocentric to a heliocentric system? Helio meaning sun, geo meaning earth, so earth-centric to sun-centric. Well, <clears throat> the heliocentric orbit hypothesis 
in the 16th century or the 1500s was an idea suggested by Copernicus. And then um, Galileo, Gal um, in the early 17th century or the 1600s, he observed phases of Venus using a telescope. And when he did that, he saw what you see in the picture here. He saw changes in the size and shape of Venus, like you see in this picture. And so he used early telescopes to observe and um, what you'd expect to see in a geocentric system is the um, as as the um, as Venus goes around the Earth in relationship to the Sun, the light that hits Venus should look like what you see on the left. But what he saw in the telescope was what you see on the right. So now what does he do with that data? What does he do with those facts? And that, that gives me the opportunity to, to mention it's really important to think in terms of facts and dealing with those facts. Facts are stubborn things. Um, maybe it's John Adams that said that. Facts are stubborn things. And um, I think he used that to defend a, uh, a a British soldier that had had killed somebody in the American Revolutionary time. But that's also true when we look certainly true when you look at science. Facts are stubborn things. So what do you do with this data? You have to do something with the data. And um, with the powers that be in the church. Now, this is a useful. Uh, this is really good YouTube to watch because what it does is it shows how the planets would have to move in order to observe what we see in space with because they're very good at looking at planets and, and figuring out how to get them to move move and th this does explain how the planets do move including the Sun around if the earth is in the middle in other words a geocentric model it's, it's just really fun to watch this and I've watched two or three times because it's just not simple and elegant like um, elliptical orbits around the Sun but it does work. Now this is a neat diagram it shows just kind of a, a diagram of the solar system I'd read through and look at description of each one of the planets and kind of especially how they're built at the bottom look at how they're made this is in your book but notice that the earth and Venus have a solid and liquid core Mars does not and notice that the gaseous planets um, are just mostly that is gas with a small core in the middle um, small core core as large as the earth in the middle but small compared to the planet um, the fact that we have a liquid core has huge implications on what we, we what we have as far as a planet that's livable. So this is just a good summary slide. Okay, the solar system is, it includes the sun and surrounding planets. Sun is 99.8 percent of the total mass of the solar system, and the distance between the Earth and the Sun is 150 million kilometers. The Sun um, undergoes differential rotation. Um, it has sunspots, it has solar flares, and um, it's interesting the Sun's equatorial region rotates faster than the polar regions. So uh, the whole Sun doesn't just rotate like the Earth does. The, uh, the equator rotates faster than than the poles, north and south pole of the sun. So that results in disruption of the sun's magnetic field and so that's what produces these sunspots and solar flares. The sunspot cycle um, varies over time and here we see a diagram of where you get um, this shows like from 1994, 1992 maybe through 2010 and you notice in the early 2000s you know about 2001 
there was a solar maximum where you had lots of um, sunspots. Variation in the number of sunspots um, over 11 year cycles is what we're seeing here. There are a few sunspots during solar minimum and a maximum of 100 sunspots during the solar maximum. Okay, solar wind is a stream of charged particles emitted from the sun's magnetic field. The solar wind affects in volume and space known as the heliosphere. And um, praise God, we have a magnetic field that deflects that solar wind so that we don't feel those effects because our magnetic field, which keeps, keeps that from uh, affecting the Earth very much. Interactions of solar wind with the Earth magnetic field generates an aurora. So we have an aurora borealis and aurora australis. Um, you can see aurora from the Earth. You can also see an aurora in space. Top pictures from the Earth. And uh, if you go to the northern, uh, northern part of the U.S. or up into Canada, uh, you can see, see an aurora during the winter especially. Um, no, maybe not. Maybe maybe in the winter or summer. I've never actually seen one. Um, occasionally, solar eruptions can disrupt the Earth's magnetic field and produce electrical blackouts. Um, it's interesting to think just what would happen if we had too big a solar flare and what that would do to uh, the um, uh, electrical the systems that rely on electricity here on Earth. Okay, we've seen this picture before. I find this picture helpful because it shows all the different um, hand, you know, I, I use the, the one for Earth all the time where you draw a circle and put a cross through it. That's the Earth. It's easier than writing out Earth. The sun is a circle with a dot in the middle. Mercury's kind of fun. It looks like a little devil and with his little horns. And Venus is the female sign and Mars is the male sign. But these are the symbols for each one of the planets. And Pluto's there too, even though it's not a planet anymore. There's eight planets because Pluto is no longer a planet. Um, so what about Pluto? What about Pluto? Well, improved technology resulted in recent discoveries of several distant objects that were in similar size larger than Pluto. So then what do you do with those? <laughs> They either had to give us more planets or less planets because it didn't make sense to keep Pluto a planet and then not allow those others to be planets. So they declassified Pluto as a planet, gave us eight planets instead of nine. We all went into mourning. We were all very sad about that, but it, it, it kind of made sense because otherwise we'd have lots more planets. The IAU adopted a new definition for the term planet in order to deal with the problem and they came up with a new class of object called dwarf planets. So a planet is an object that orbits a star and is a massive enough for gravity to pull its material into an approximately spherical shape. And a planet would have cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. Pluto does not meet the last part of the definition. In other words, it's um, doesn't clear the neighborhood, doesn't have a spherical shape. So it's a founding of a new type of class of an object called a dwarf planet. Let's talk about the difference between the Jovian or the gas planets and the terrestrial planets. Terrestrial planets are composed of rocks. Now we're getting into Earth science here, or the study of the Earth, so the solar system. And, um, <clears throat> Those rocks have compositional layers, and the Earth is divided into layers of crust, mantle, and core. And then the core is divided into a, a solid outer core and a liquid inner core. Or no, I, mean, I get that backwards. A liquid outer core and a solid inner core. Um, you also see the crust. This um, top part of the crust is divided into a continental crust, oceanic crust, and then a rigid upper mantle, lithosphere, and a plastic layer in the upper mantle, called we call the asthenosphere. The Jovian planets are large gas planets. Much of the volume of the planets is thick atmosphere. 
Um, for example, Jupiter has a real small, compared to the size of the planet, it's larger than Earth, but it's, it's a rocky middle and then lots of gas outside of that, mostly methane. <clears throat> Jupiter has four moons, and there's all kinds of good science fiction stories about um, going and mining the moons of Jupiter and things like that. So Saturn has a ring system and uh, its gravitational pull of the moons keeps the ring system in place. Okay. One other thing I think is think, a good thing to think about and especially when we're looking at changes in science is when, when, when something that happened in your life where you thought about something and required to change your point of view. Um, that happens to all of us. Some of us deal with change better than others. It's good life skill if we can learn to deal with change and deal with it well. Uh, we usually end up thinking, it would, if you know anything about Kubler-Ross's stages of grief, we end up going through those kind of stages of grief when we, when we experience change. Well, it's true in science too. Okay, here's a, another little test about sunspots, flares, and other emissions from the sun's sur surface have a negative impact on the electrical systems on the Earth. What would be the in implications for this type of solar activity if the sun did not rotate? Well, there would be less sunspot activity. Well, it's because the differential rotation between the equator and the poles on the sun is what causes those sunspots and flares. The question, the sun is located located approximately 150 million kilometers from Earth. If scientists identified a solar flare leaving the sun's surface, how long would it take to affect electrical systems on Earth? A few days. So there's scientists that observe the sun and come up with a risk analysis of what they see as far as solar flares. And we'd have a few days if it was big enough before we know that our electrical grid would be fried. Another question, which satellite view shows the sun approaching a maximum in the sunspot cycle? And that would be C. We can see there's lots more activity there. What are the principal components of the sun? That's hydrogen and helium. Remember that stars are mostly hydrogen and one proton and, um, and helium two proton. Okay, here's a Venn diagram comparing terrestrial planets to jovial planets. Um, I'll just kind of go through them in order. One, they both orbit the sun. Jovian planets are <coughs> gas planets. Jovial planets have strong gravitational fields. They're larger. Terrestrial planets are smaller. Terrestrial planets have rocky surfaces. Both have atmospheres. Both are spherical. Jovian planets may have rings. Um, they have multiple moons. Although, um, actually, that should be in both. That's not right. Number 10, because Mars has two moons. So uh, that one's wrong. 11, um, uh, terrestrial planets either have or used to have a hot interior. That's true with Mars also, although it's rocky interior now. But it, it cooled off, and that's one reason we think Mars is more of a dead planet now than it used to be, because that interior is no longer active. Um, terrestrial planets are Earth-like, Earth could be. They're closer to the sun. They have shorter orbits. They have compositional layers, and we talked about the layers on the Earth in a little slide above. They're more closely spaced. In other words, that revolutions around the Sun are closer to each other. Um, the variable atmospheres vary. For example, the atmosphere of Mars is very different than the one of Venus and Earth. They're all formed about the same time um, as debris was consolidated through gravitational attraction around the Sun. Earth Science Chapter 2 Earth and Space Earth-Sun-Moon Relationships So what patterns must the Earth and Sun relationship be able to explain? 
Well, some questions that we can answer are, why is it hotter at the equator and colder at the poles? Why is it colder in January or the winter than the summer or July? Why is it summer in Australia when it's winter in the U.S.? And by the way, the uh, perspective on this lecture and probably from the whole course is from the northern hemisphere or from the Midwest in the uh, central Midwest area. So if you're watching this um, lecture from the southern hemisphere, my apologies, but uh, I've got to pick some perspective and most of my students will be in the North America area. So why is it colder in the winter and warmer in the summer? Well, it's a common misconception that the Earth is closer to the sun in the summer and further away in the winter. The Earth is actually close to the sun in the winter and further away in the summer. But that distance really doesn't affect um, really doesn't affect whether we have winter or summer on the Earth. So why is it colder in winter and warmer in summer? Well, it's because the Earth tilts on its axis at a... Um, it, it actually tilts about 23 and a half degrees now. It has, over Earth history, it's tilted um, different amounts. And um, we'll study that when we get into Earth history. But currently it's at 23 and a half degrees. And... Um, We have the Tropic of Cancer in the Northern Hemisphere and the Tropic of Capricorn in the Southern Hemisphere as the limits, and each of those are 23 and a half degrees from the equator because as the Earth revolves around the Sun, um, the Sun will be directly overhead either at the Tropic of Cancer or the Tropic of Capricorn depending on um, um, which side of the Sun the Earth has revolved around. Okay, um, <clears throat> here's an example of why it's hotter in one place than another place with the sun either being directly overhead or not directly overhead. Notice up is um, for the person in Greenland at the top of the diagram. Up is, um, is um, kind of to the upper part of your slide and the sun is way low on the horizon. He'd be, he'd be seeing the sun not overhead at all, whereas a person standing close to the equator in Central Africa, the sun would be directly overhead. Well, you can say, yeah, it's pretty obvious, but, you know, what? It's only obvious when we experience it, but it's not necessarily obvious why. So we're talking about, this is the reason that it's hotter in um, the central part of the globe around the equator than it is up in Greenland. So the solar energy is diluted over a larger area when sunlight strikes at a low angle. The sun is directly overhead at different places, in the tropics, the equator during different seasons. By the way, it's important for you to know the difference between spring equinox, summer solstice, fall equinox, and winter solstice. Um, equinox is um, a hint in other words, it's like the equator. The sun is directly over the equator in the spring and the fall. Equinox, equator. And the summer and winter solstice is when the sun is directly overhead, either in the Tropic of Cancer or the Tropic of Capricorn. So test question might be, is the sun directly overhead in the summer on the Tropic of Cancer or the Tropic of Capricorn? Well, Cancer is in the northern, northern hemisphere, so it would be directly overhead in the summer solstice over the Tropic of Cancer. And in the winter, in the winter solstice, it would be directly overhead in the Tropic of Capricorn. Um, I think we've covered what's on this slide already. Okay, let's talk about why the length of day changes. Uh, the hours of daylight change. Um, um, with latitude and also with time of year. The higher latitudes, in other words, further toward the North Pole, have more daylight than low latitudes in the summer and less in the winter. And also the time of year. Um, all locations have more daylight in the summer and less in the winter. 
Okay, let's look at the phases of the moon. Um, phase of the moon, if we just take the date here, the 1st through the 31st, you have a full moon. And I like to think of the dark side of the moon moving from the right to the left. And the full moon um, changes to a gibbous moon about the 3rd or the 4th. And as the gibbous means that more than half of it is bright until the last quarter on the 16th. This is just an example from August 2012. Every every month it'll be a little different. Um, uh, the uh, <clears throat> and then the the dark side continues to move from the right to the left from the 17th to the uh, 24th when you have a new moon, and the phase of the moon would be. Um, there would be called a waning crescent. The gibbous would have been called a, a waning gibbous moon. And uh, waning just means that the light on the moon is getting smaller. Well, then the light on the moon starts getting larger after the new moon, and the shadow continues to move from the right to the left. And so then you have a waxing crescent, and then a waxing gibbous, and then a new, and then a full moon. So you can always tell whether the moon is waning or waxing because of which side the um, dark side is. So if you look at the 6th, the dark side is on the right. If you look at the 26th, the dark side is on the left. So the 6th is a, a, waning, a waning gibbous and the 26th is a, is a waxing gibbous because the 6th is getting, the light is getting smaller and the 26th is getting larger. That's important in this diagram tells you the different phases of the moon. So it would be important as an earth science student to know what each of these means and be able to memorize them. And you can either memorize them or you can think in terms of that, that dark shadow moving from right to the left. Okay, here's a diagram the Navy might use on, on um, helping know when when in 2012 you'd have uh, different phases of the moon. Okay, question here, just kind of summarizing, how do we define the length of the year on Earth? Well, a year is related to revolution of the Earth around the Sun, not the rotation. Rotation has to do with um, the spin of the Earth on its axis. So length of a year is revolution. The um, time turn of the day is um, Something to think about that's, I think, important is how are we influenced by Earth's position in space on a daily basis? Um, that The moon diagram we looked at a minute ago was from a fishing website. Well, the fact that the relationship between the Earth and the moon affects fish. So that's something important to be aware of. Isn't it? And that's just one example. The Earth would be furthest from the sun. If the Earth were further from the sun, the planet would be colder. If the Earth's biosphere were younger, we would have less oxygen in the atmosphere. Well, that's because we haven't had as much time for um, oxygen to build up the atmosphere because oxygen comes from mostly plants, and it takes time for that oxygen to build up in the atmosphere. So one of the reasons the Earth um, has the amount of oxygen we have is because the Earth is as old as it is and has had time to build up on oxygen in the atmosphere. If the Earth were smaller, its atmosphere would be thinner. In other words, we wouldn't, our gravity wouldn't hold the atmosphere that we have. What would the temp happen to the average temperature of the equator during our summer if the tilt angle of Earth's axis increased to 27 degrees? Well, the, instead of 23 and a half degrees, well, the temperatures would decrease. In other words, it'd get colder. Yeah. Um, how would the amount of incoming solar radiation change at the equator if the Earth's axis were vertical instead of tilted? Well, it would increase because the Earth would not, um, it wouldn't point toward the sun as much if, if the uh, tilt were 
if it wasn't tilted as much as it is now. What must happen to the tilt angle of the Earth's axis in order to have vertical rays where you live in the summer solstice? Well, the tilt would increase. In other words, um, we live about where we live, it's about 40 degrees north, so um, we'd have to really tilt a lot more. The moon has what type of orbit? It's a geocentric. In other words, the Earth is the center of the moon's orbit. Mars has a more asymmetric orbit of the Earth, of the sun, than Earth. Mars is 20% closer to the sun during its winter than during the summer. How would Earth's climate be affected if Earth had a similar eccentric orbit, being 20% closer to the sun during winter months or in the northern hemisphere? Well, um, temperatures would be higher than they are currently in the winter in the northern hemisphere. And an orbit that took us closer to the sun would also be a shorter orbit, making the length of the year be shorter. This would result in changed growing seasons, significant differences in native vegetation, changes in precipitation, melting ice caps, greatly impacting our life. And here's a Venn diagram. So Earth, Mars is smaller. They both orbit the sun. Earth is closer to the sun. Mars receives less solar energy. Mars has a thinner atmosphere. Earth has a thicker atmosphere. Um, Earth has a stronger magnetic field. Earth has a colder interior. Um, I'm not sure that's right. H should be over on Mars. That's, that's not right. Mars has a colder interior. Nine, um, Earth has more compositional layers. Um, liquid water at the surface ought to be over on Earth. That's wrong too. Good grief. Ten should be over on Earth and not on Mars because Earth has liquid water on the surface. Mars has no biosphere that we know of and Mars has lots of craters on the surface where the Earth has um, eroded those and Earth Science, Chapter 2, Earth and Space, Composition of the Earth. Uh, the Earth has a unique composition. It can, it's divided into uh, three layers, three compositional layers, crust, mantle, and core. It has a solid inner core and a partially melted outer core, which gives us the source of the Earth's magnetic field, critical to um, making sure life can exist on the Earth's surface. The Earth's crust is divided between continental crust and oceanic crust. And underneath that very top crustal layer is a rigid upper mantle. We call that the lithosphere. And a plastic layer in the upper mantle we call the asthenosphere. Lithosphere, asthenosphere. Okay, next slide talks about that. Let you read through that. Okay, looking at the lithosphere, the lithosphere is divided into large slabs known as tectonic plates. And these plates move over the Earth's surface and they produce earthquakes, volcanoes, mountain belts, various features on the seafloor. We're going to talk a lot about this, so I won't go into all the detail on this slide because this, this is the main driver of what creates um, the, the features we see on the Earth's surface. A main driver of the systems that we see on the Earth, uh, what makes the rocks the way they are, um, the list goes on and on and on. Plate tectonics is a, is a major system driver on the Earth. Okay, the Earth's temperature increases with depth. So as you go down in the Earth, it uh, temperature rises 25 um, degrees centigrade per kilometer. So as you go down the Earth, it gets hotter. You go a kilometer down to the Earth, it's going to go up about 25 degrees centigrade. Well, where does heat come from in the Earth? Well, it first of all came from the formation of the planet. All terrestrial planets cooled cooled following their initial formation and um, only the large planets still retain heat so Mars and uh, 
Mercury really don't retain much heat, whereas Venus and Earth do, and we're just talking terrestrial planets there. Another thing that creates um, heat in the Earth is radioactive decay. Um, elements in the Earth interior um, like uranium-235 decay and gives off heat when it does that. Um, here's estimated temperatures 10 kilometers under the Earth and notice the darker um, the red is um, um, red is warmer blue is greener is cooler and um, we call that a geothermal gradient Earth shares many features with other planets so what makes it so special? Well, We have liquid water, we have gravity and a protective atmosphere we have life-sustaining gases, we have a strong magnetic field, and the list goes on. Earth truly is unique, and uh, God created the Earth in a unique way, otherwise we couldn't have life on the Earth. Let's talk about liquid water. It's essential for any life, and uh, liquid water has a range of 0 to 100 degrees centigrade. Um, in between freezing and boiling. Well, the Venus is too close to the Sun, so original water evaporated in the atmosphere. And also on Venus, water vapor molecules, or H2O, two hydrogens and one ox oxygen, are split by ultraviolet radiation, and um, hydrogen is lost into space. Well, Mars is too cold today to have liquid water. There's, there's water on Mars, but it's frozen, so it's, it's just too cold. Earth's size is sufficient to produce enough gravity to hold thick atmosphere of gases in place. And that atmosphere is critical to um, protect us from incoming asteroids and comets. And also it protects us from harmful solar radiation such as uh, ultraviolet UV or also x-rays. Um, otherwise um, we couldn't live. Biosphere or life on the Earth has altered the composition of the atmosphere to include oxygen and to extract um, carbon dioxide, which is toxic to uh, animals. And um, the atmosphere composition also affects temperature. If you have higher carbon dioxide, then you have higher temperatures. And on Venus, um, you have temperatures of like 646 degrees centigrade because of high carbon dioxide. Um, the composition of Earth's atmosphere just is just right to absorb enough heat to keep the average temperature at 15 degrees centigrade. There's a greenhouse effect that helps keep the Earth warm. And um, water vapor and carbon dioxide um, gases, both, both those types of gas absorb heat. If we did not have greenhouse gases, then the average temperature would be minus 18 degrees centigrade. In other words, below freezing. So the greenhouse gases are critical, or the greenhouse effects critical to keep the average temperature above freezing. Well, the Earth's magnetic field is important too because it protects the Earth from harmful solar wind that would strip away our atmosphere. So we wouldn't have an atmosphere if we didn't have a magnetic field. We wouldn't have a magnetic field if we didn't have a liquid outer core. And so God has created a great design so that we can protect life on the surface of the earth. Magnetic field is due to molten rocks in the outer core and the relative rapid planetary rotation. So the fact that our planet is rotating on its axis and there's a liquid inside the planet gives us a magnetic field. So here's a concept map. One of these little map things where we start with one. Earth has three compositional layers. Um, we have absolute additional layer of the crust, outer core, um, the crust, the mantle, and the core. It should say mantle in that middle one. No, that's going to have a tan in it. Um, <clears throat> that core is partially melted. 
outer core. Okay, this isn't working too well. I'm just going to fill these in and talk about them. Okay, so let's just talk them through. Okay, the Earth has three compositional layers. The um, crust, the mantle, and the outer core. Has the, outer, the outer core on the right side of the diagram has an, or that core has an inner core, solid inner core, and partially melted outer core. Um, the outer, outer core is the source of the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, if we go over to the left side of the diagram, the Earth has two outer mechanical layers. I'm looking at the blue. Um, it has an upper rigid um, lithosphere going from mechanical layers to six to eight. It had mechanical layers has a lower partially melted number five asthenosphere. And both of those, the asthenosphere and the lithosphere um, are part of upper parts of the mantle. So, okay, well, there's a concept map. And there it is all filled in.